Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this programme today, we'll be discussing the spiritual and political connection between Israel and Africa. Warm welcome to the program, and I have a special guest today, uh, Archbishop Doye Agoma. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Simon uh, uh, Barrett. It's great to be here on the Middle East Report. No, absolutely. It's, it sounds good, doesn't it? Um, I have to ask you, uh, uh, Doye, and I, looking at your CV, you sent me your CV prior to the program, uh, and it's incredibly impressive. I mean, you have a heart for Israel, you have a heart for the Jewish people, and you've bridged that gap between uh, African Christians and the nation of Israel. And um, that is a, a very, very special job on and, and, and what you've done, and that, the connection you've made between Africa and Israel is just extraordinary. But can you tell us where it all began for you? How did you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, well, I, I grew up in a Christian home, but um, I first uh, prayed the sinner's prayer during the um, Civil War, uh, the attempted breakaway of Biafra from, um, from Nigeria uh, back in the 60s. And um, it was just um, a time when uh, most of us learn to pray, um, even those who you thought didn't know how to pray started praying. So I, um, I, I first gave my life in that conscious way um, that Pentecostals describe in 1968. Um, after that conflict, I had um, what today you'd probably call some kind of post-traumatic uh, um, stress or disorder and had um, quite a difficult few years. Um, and then I had an encounter with the Lord when um, he um, finally got me to, to agree that um, I would work for him. So, and here we are. Fantastic. Um, but I suppose in terms of relationship with Israel, uh, when I was uh, a very young child, our next door neighbors were Jewish. We weren't actually next door, they were the house behind us and there was a hedge between, but there was a hole in the hedge big enough for small boys to get through. <laughs> um, and so uh, their, their son and I were like brothers and we, um, uh, we were inseparable really. If, 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 if he got um, measles, I got measles. If I got chicken pox, he got chicken. We were that close, you know. And um, I was welcome in that home in, in a way that was different and I could also, even at that young age, uh, discover and discern that there were people who didn't really like him. And they seemed to be the same people who didn't really like me. So um, we, we were good friends. We were good friends, yeah. yeah. Uh, when did the Lord real, really put a love for Israel on, on your heart? Because it's a big passion of, of your life. You've, done, you've worked very closely with, uh, with Mag and Davida Dom. You, you've served on a co-chancel of uh, Christians and Jews up in Manchester, Council of Christians and Jews, that is. Yes, well, I, I lost that friend. I, I, I later found out um, that there were some tragic circumstances in that family going back to the Holocaust and, and all of that. Um, but um, perhaps in compensation in some way, my mother gave me a copy of Anne Frank's diary, um, which gave me a perspective that I, I didn't realize you know, earlier on. And I graduated from that into Leon Uris' uh, series of books and devoured those. And, and that was my interest growing. And when we were in, in Biafra, um, Israel was one of the few countries that, that did um, informally kind of recognize and try to help that uh, fledgling state while it lasted. So I don't really remember a, a specific time when I sort of fell in love with Israel, it's sort of just been there. I, um, it's just natural. 
Fantastic. Uh, uh, and, you know, can you tell us of the uh, deep connection between the continent of Africa uh, and the Bible? Well, certainly, um, when, I, when I was writing my book, uh, Africa, Christianity and the Bible, um, I soon found that you couldn't tell this story without telling the story of a relationship between Jewish people and African people. And um, if you take Abraham, for example, there's, there's famine in Israel, and, and Abraham comes to Africa, not on a holiday, he comes into Africa to survive. And he, he's given food there, and he, he gains extra wealth there, um, and, and that for me is symbolic of the fact that, that the um, ancient Israelites, if you like, and African peoples had a lot of interaction that we really don't recognize today. And, and this was at a time when there are no Arabs in North Africa. Uh, they come much later after the Islamic invasions. So the people whom Abraham and uh, Jacob and, and, and his family uh, meet in Africa are actually Africans. Um, perhaps not uh, sub-Saharan Africans, but they are definitely um, the Nile peoples. Uh, and Israel itself is born in Africa. Israel becomes a nation in Africa. Uh, they come in as a group of less than 100 people, and gradually they prosper. We, we talk today about the persecution of the Jews in Egypt, but the story that's not told is that actually Africa was the safe haven at a time when um, the area of Israel was under attack from, and there was a lot of chaos, and they prospered in Africa. It was the prosperity that brought the jealousy of the local people after the Pharaoh who had loved and appreciated them was gone. So it's a very ancient story. It's a story that runs right through the Bible. And it's a story that is not being told enough today. Fascinating. And, and also we, we, we find the story of uh, Solomon, don't we? And yes. uh, Queen Sheba is uh, an example yes. where uh, an African queen decided to pay homage to uh, King Solomon. Yes, indeed. And they um, have, have a son and he is uh, Menelik I who begins the um, the Judaic um, uh, period in the rulers of Ethiopia. So the, the ruling classes in Ethiopia are Jews before they become Christians. And today we talk about Ethiopia being the first, you know, sort of Christian nation on the African continent and all of that. Well, before they became Christians, they were Jews. And again, this is a story that a lot of Africans don't, don't seem to, to really know. They know that Solomon and Sheba met and, and um, were uh, married in, in some way, perhaps not by our modern standard, but it was perhaps a political marriage of sorts. Um, in, in the book, Africa, Christianity and the Bible, I describe it as, as a political alliance more really than a conventional marriage because these were two powers at that time and, and these were the two rulers of those two powers and it happens that one was female and one was male and in coming together they prevented their two nations from perhaps meeting on the battlefield. Absolutely. And also we have to talk about um, Jesus as well, because uh, after he was born, uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus fled to Egypt for safety and protection until um, Herod uh, died and they could go back to the land of Israel. So there is that deep connection, isn't there, and spiritual connection between the Jewish people, the Bible and the continent of Africa. Absolutely. Even when the Saviour needed to be saved, it was Africa again that came to the rescue, as it were. And one of the things that um, <clears throat> I have felt as I researched this is that perhaps one of the reasons why, if you like, the devil does not like Africa is simply because at several critical times in the story of the Bible, it's been Africa that's been the safe haven. And on the way to the cross, 
it's an African who carries the cross, um, Simon of Cyrene, who carries the, you know, does the last few steps with Jesus. So it's a wonderful story, and I think it should inspire every Jew, every Jewish community, and everyone uh, who is an African or loves the continent of Africa to, to see a time and a future where the Jewish people and people in Africa will rediscover this history. Absolutely, which is incredible. Uh, and Adoye, uh, shouldn't we also mention the fact that also that Africa became a, a safe haven uh, for many of the Jewish community um, fleeing the Spanish Inquisition who found their homes in, uh, in North Africa and nations like Morocco and what have you? That's very true, Simon. That, um, this was a time when we have the first of what we today call the Sephardi communities in North Africa. Uh, but, um, the Jewish uh, presence in North Africa goes back much, much further than that. Um, and, and some of those are people who originally are brought out of Israel by the Romans. The Romans deported thousands and thousands of Jews and left them in North Africa. So you, you already had communities there who then cross over into the Iberian Peninsula. And then after the Inquisitions, they cross back into Africa. So they are Africans twice over, if you like. Fabulous. Uh, and what about some of the uh, emerging um, Jewish communities now? Because we've got an interesting um, video to, to show you. Uh, and uh, this is a, a tribe in Nigeria who are actually claiming that they have a, a Jewish heritage. From deep inside Africa, a sound is emanating that is causing reverberations around the world. It's the sound of Judaism. sound of a people casting off two centuries of colonialism, returning to what they say are their native roots. I know from birth I'm a Jew. Only I know that my forefather missed the way. I grew up alongside every other Igbo youth. We kept on hearing that Igbo people came from Israel. There was a story my mom told me at the age of six years. I never forget. He said, the Igbos are Jews. And it's a story of one man, Shimuel, who went searching for what that meant and found answers on the internet, prompting a journey that led him to a community of thousands of Jews. A place where resources are few, but commitment transcends. Through prayer, practice, ritual, diet, and song. But this is also the sound of doubt from Jews in America. They would ask me, are you from America? Or we have said, no, I'm a Nigerian. They say, you black, I said, yes. They said, no, it's not true. And rejection from family and friends. I am like an outcast among them. And in this volatile Christian Muslim nation, doubt often turns to violence. This is the story of the Igbo, 25 million strong, a people once under siege by their very own government. Biafra declared its independence. And a people once captured and shipped across the Atlantic by the hundreds of thousands. A people who helped build America and a people whose descendants are now discovering their Igbo roots, raising questions of cultural identity for countless African Americans. Many African Americans actually do not know that they have Igbo heritage. The chances of their being Igbo is much, much higher than their chances of coming from Ghana or from Western Nigeria. If you're from the right county in Virginia, you'd probably have a 60% chance of having Igbo ancestry. It's a story of the strength of belief 
ancestry, and community. Boosted by a visitor who inspires everyone and helps take Shemuel's dreams to a whole new reality. The Jews of Nigeria are re-emerging. And uh, Doya, what do you do you make of that uh, interesting report there? Um, that uh, some of these uh, Nigerian tribe in particular uh, f feel and identify uh, with the Jewish people. Well, it's wonderful, and I uh, trust they will identify with um, the the Jewish Messiah as well. Um, <clears throat> there is, uh, though, uh, a process, as far as I know, um, for the rabbis in in Israel. Um, to uh, accept and prove that people have um, Jewish ancestry. Um, so perhaps they, they want to investigate that and, and see how they can um, work their way through that process. Uh, that, but it's without doubt that there are um, Jews scattered across Africa um, who history may have forgotten. Um, I, I sp spoke to you a little before we came on air uh, about uh, the Jews of Timbuktu. Um, who for centuries uh, lived as merchants and as soldiers uh, in that part of Africa. Uh, they were the Jews of, of Gambia and, and Senegal. And there's so many places that there were Jewish communities. And I, I do hope someone, uh, maybe from the academic sphere, mm -hmm. uh, someone probably with more expertise than, than I have, um, would be um, digging deeper to find, to find out not just about these people in Nigeria, but uh, others as well. I also have to remember the incredible um, airlift of the uh, Ethiopian Jewish community um, through Operation uh, Solomon, yes. um, which the Israeli government um, sent uh, aircraft. I think it was around 89, was it 1989, during the civil war in Ethiopia? Um, Thereabouts. That, that we saw the emergence, really, of uh, the large wave of... Uh, of Ethiopian Jews making Aliyah to Israel. Uh, extraordinary moment. Yes, indeed. Um, a historic moment and a, a truly uh, inspiring uh, operation uh, by the Israeli government to do that. Of course, there are still a great many uh, people of Jewish heritage in Ethiopia who perhaps couldn't qualify uh, for that airlift and who, some of whom now found, found, find themselves sort of neither here nor there, and uh, they need to be remembered too, uh, perhaps with some sort of development aid, even if they can't leave Africa, uh, because it's, um, it's not a good situation for a lot of them. Um, but yes, that was a very dramatic and historic moment see all of these African Jews uh, arriving in Israel and the celebrations. Yes, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. So let's have a look at the plight of uh, Ethiopian Jews now living in Israel. When most people think of Jews, they imagine white Europeans, i.e. those Jews that established communities in Europe. However, not all Jews actually went to Europe. Some stayed in Israel, Others went to other areas of the Middle East, such as Iraq and Yemen, North Africa, Persia, and others went as far as China. In Sub-Saharan Africa exists one of the most ancient Jewish communities, the Jews of Ethiopia. So who are these mysterious Jews? Well, first, let's explore where Ethiopia is on a map. Ethiopia is located in the Horn of Africa. It shares a border with Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and Kenya. The official language of the 100 million strong population is Amharic, a Semitic language related to Berber, Arabic, Hebrew, and Aramaic. The majority of the population, around two thirds, is Christian Orthodox, and one third is Muslim. Ethiopia's diverse population has over 80 different ethnic groups including a small Jewish minority, making up only 0.001% of the entire population. The exact origin of Ethiopian Jews is hotly debated within academic circles. 
The general consensus is that they are descendants of the lost tribe of Dan, one of the original 12 tribes of Israel. Ethiopian Jews settled in the north and northwestern parts of Ethiopia, in more than 500 small villages spread over a wide territory. These villages are so remote that for centuries had no contact with the outside world. However, despite their isolation for more than 2,000 years, Ethiopian Jews were able to maintain kosher dietary laws and their Jewish traditions. Due to their isolation from the mainstream Jewish world, the question of the Jewishness of the Beta Israel community was officially raised in 1973 to the Israeli chief Sephardi rabbi Ovadia Yosef. The rabbi cited a rabbinic ruling from the 16th century of David ben Solomon ibn Abi Zirma and asserted that the Beta Israel were in fact descendants of the lost tribe of Dan. His ruling was initially rejected by the chief Ashkenazi rabbi Shlomo Goen, but he eventually reconsidered the following year. And in April of 1975, the Israeli government of Yitzhak Rabin officially accepted and welcomed the Beta Israel community. In the late 1970s, civil war broke out in Ethiopia. And there was only one choice for Ethiopian Jews, Aliyah to Israel. In a series of operations, the Israeli government was able to airlift around 57,000 Jews from the 1980s to 1990s and resettled them in Israel. Today, the Beta Israel community numbers around 121,000. And Ethiopian Jews can be found in all parts of Israeli society, from serving in the Israeli Defense Forces, to being famous musicians, and even serving in the Israeli parliament. And uh, we, we salute uh, the uh, Jewish Ethiopian community uh, in Israel for the way that they've integrated in Israel and for the way they serve the nation. I did get my facts wrong, uh, which is unusual. Um, but Operation Solomon was a covert Israeli military operation to airlift Ethiopian Jews to Israel in 1991. Uh, they took 35 uh, flights that included Israeli Air Force uh, C-130s and uh, Al Al Boeing 747s and transported 14,325 Ethiopian Jews to Israel in 36 hours. Incredible. Wow. That is amazing. And it speaks not just of the um, efficiency um, of that operation, but also of a deep spiritual commitment. Uh, these people are being airlifted because they are part of Israel. And... Um, Yes, a very efficient and wonderful operation, but it speaks something much deeper Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Uh, and also, during the, the re-establishment of the State of Israel, uh, back in the 14th of May, um, 1948, and uh, we recently remembered Israel's 70th anniversary as a nation reborn, uh, Adurai. We also have to remember as well that during the early years of uh, Israel's development as a modern state, uh, Israel had very close relationship with many African nations, really up until the Arab influence after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Can you share something about that conflict between whether African states align themselves with Israel or whether they then align themselves with the Arab states? Yes, it, it has been a source of a great deal of difficulty. And I think that um, the... Uh, the embargo, the oil embargo, um, didn't just affect uh, European politics, it also affected African politics. And it did also um, mean that w wherever you had Muslims, particularly in leadership across Africa, they also found themselves in a moment of decision. and. Um, Historically, quite a number of them uh, did decide that they would take sides with the Arab bloc. Um, a, a lot of these nations across Africa um, had some connections through uh, either the non-aligned movement or through the uh, organization of, of Islamic uh, uh, conference. Um, and uh, these groupings, 
became also places where they were pressurized. And so, yes, there was a sea change. There was a definite shift that happened um, in that season. Um, but I think that um, there is a change that is happening. Um, and it is important, particularly, that Christian leaders across Africa um, should not only uh, side with Israel, but should help to be um, to speak on behalf of Israel to their colleagues in order that people will have the complete story. Absolutely. Uh, and also, I think one of the uh, classic cases of uh, incredible hostility towards Israel, and that was in Uganda with uh, yes. President Amin, uh, particularly as we saw the Entebbe raid, that he was w he willing to um, host uh, that uh, aircraft, a uh, French uh, airline aircraft that was... Um, hijacked um, by groups like PFLP uh, and also some of the Marxist uh, German groups and to actually give safe haven to them uh, in, in Uganda, which um, Israel carried out probably one of the most audacious rescue missions in history to, uh, to, get, their, uh, to get the Jewish people back into Israel. Um, but since then, relations between Uganda uh, and Israel have uh, improved remarkably, haven't they? Because uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, recently visited um, Uganda in 2016. Yes, there has been uh, quite a lot of improvement, not only in Uganda, but across the African continent. And Israel has been very active, not only in Africa, but around the world in uh, providing humanitarian assistance, but also the incredible technologies that have been developed in Israel uh, have been a great help in many parts of Africa and have helped the people not only to solve practical problems, but also to see the other side of Israel, uh, to see uh, Israel, the, 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 hu the humanity, the compassion and, and the genuineness of Israel, um, which is a different story from what you will sometimes hear from the headlines. Absolutely. And before we talk about that, we also have to, to consider that the enemies of Israel are also Africa's enemies. And certainly over the last uh, 30, or years, 30 years in particular, we've, we've seen the Arab influence on, on the African continent with the spread of Wahhabism, uh, Islamic extremism, also yes. the Iranians as well, very much active in Africa, uh, making it a battleground not only against Israel, but also against the West. Yes, it, it is um, something that is very real and, and present and dangerous. And um, in fact, when, when I was writing this book a few years ago now, I did, um, I, I did predict that as the supposed caliphate was being dismantled in the Middle East, that Afri Africa would become more and more attractive to ISIS and to Al-Qaeda. And um, the uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and ISIS uh, are proving to be quite an adaptable and difficult problem across a huge swathe now of North Africa, into West, down all the way to West Africa, um, in places like Nigeria, where you have the Boko Haram factions, um, and the, um, the influence, I would say, from the Gulf, whether you call it Persian or the Arab Gulf, but the Gulf influence has in places been benign, but unfortunately also has in, in many places has been part of very serious problems that have led to um, huge displacement of peoples, disruption of services, and many deaths of Christians, but also of Muslims and many other people too. Uh, uh, how has um, this extreme <coughs> Islamic ideology being able to penetrate the hearts and minds of, of so many Africans to such an extent that it's caused wars, turmoils, and we've seen, for example, from Somalia to Nigeria 
to other places, uh, to the Sahara Desert, um, even with um, in North Africa as well, with Libya as a kind of now a failed state, that we're really seeing the spread of Islamic extremism from the Middle East, really having a, a dangerous and extremely worrying impact on. Um, on Africa, as well as many uh, Nigerians being converted to ISIS, carrying out uh, terrorist attacks, either attempted attacks in the US and also in Europe? Yes, well, um, in many cases, these are a continuation of old problems that now re-emerge um, with new identities. Um, so if you take the problems in northern Nigeria, um, the insurgencies along that northeastern border go back almost a hundred years. Um, the British had their own problems there. And in fact, the original leader of Boko Haram, uh, Mohammed Yusuf, um, was mentored by a man who had actually been part of the insurgency against the British army, um, who uh, came from across the border in Cameroon. And um, the uh, problems also seem to emerge in the context of young, uh, a lot of young people, but with um, no prospects, uh, very poor services, and um, a, an elite, often a Muslim elite, uh, who are not providing um, the needs of these young people. Uh, we talk about underdevelopment in the northeast of Nigeria. If, if you go back um, since the independence of that country and calculate how much money has been actually given to people who were leaders in these places um, to develop these places, um, you, you begin to see the huge gap. And um, it's an open question as to where those funds have actually gone. So, um, and then if you turn to some Somalia, um, you have essentially a place that's been lawless and in, in many parts um, and without an effective government for many years. Um, so there are combinations of, of problems, um, in, including sometimes local problems as well, that are being exploited by these um, uh, Salafist, uh, Wahhabist uh, uh, groups. So let's have a look now at uh, the Iranian influence in Africa and also the rise of uh, Iranian Shiism in Nigeria. You may have heard that since 2003, over 400,000 innocent Sudanese civilians have been killed or executed by the government-supported militia groups and that 90% of the villages of Darfur's targeted ethnic groups have been destroyed, and that approximately 3 million people have been displaced within Sudan. But did you know that Tehran is responsible for supplying millions of dollars worth of weapons directly to Sudan, despite the UN arms embargo, and that Iranians have supplied Sudan with surveillance equipment for UAV? and that a UAV was shot down flying over Darfur. That in 2008, Iran signed an agreement on military cooperation with Sudan's President Omar el-Bashir, charged with genocide by the International Criminal Court, and that Iran is exploiting other African states to promote its own interests. For example, in return for supplying oil to Zimbabwe, led by President Mugabe, was sanctioned by the U.S. government and the EU. Iran has been promised access to huge deposits of uranium ore, which are required to make a nuclear bomb. To make things worse, in October 2010, Nigerian authorities intercepted Iranian weapons being smuggled to terrorist groups in the Gambia. In response, Senegal and the Gambia, formerly Iran's closest allies, cut off their diplomatic ties with Iran after it sold weapons to rebels responsible for killing their soldiers. If this was not enough, Iran has reportedly deployed troops and constructed a large navy base in Eritrea. What will happen when Iran has the nuclear weapons and technology to sell? Take a stand against Iran's meddling in Africa before it's too late.
Nigeria has become one of the newest but very well prepared arenas for the Iranians to operate in. Iran's expansion through the country has been patiently established in the last three decades. Tehran infiltrated Nigeria with its so-called soft power, mainly through religious preaching to spread Shiite Islam. Ibrahim Zakzaki is considered to be a key figure in paving the way for Iran to gather supporters among the Nigerian population. Zakzaki, being the leader of Shia Muslims in Nigeria, started calling for an Iranian-style revolution to create an Islamic state in the country's northern areas. Zakzaki converted to Shiism in the early 1980s, when he started spreading the teachings of Ayatollah Khomeini among his fellow countrymen in a political context which should lead to the establishment of the Islamic State in Nigeria. At first, Zakzaki's approaches were strictly peaceful, up until the end of 2015, when events took a different turn. In December 2015, Zakzaki's followers, who were attending a religious ceremony, interrupted the convoy of the Nigerian Chief of Army Staff, General Tokir Yusuf Buratai. The Nigerian authorities considered that as an attempt to assassinate the general. Soon after, the army was accused of deliberately shooting dead followers of the pro-Iranian cleric. Iran's Revolutionary Guard as well found its way to operate in Nigeria, specifically by using Lagos Harbour to smuggle weapons to the country. In one court case, dating back to 2010, a member of the Revolutionary Guard was trialled for smuggling Iranian weapons. Nigerian authorities reported the incident to the Security Council. Later, three Nigerian young men were arrested as well and accused of plotting to target American interests in the country. The men have been reported as members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and received intensive military training in Iran. Extremely uh, concerning that uh, Israel's biggest enemy, Iran, is also meddling in Africa. Um, as an African, uh, Adoya, what do you make of Iran's meddling and uh, dangerous influence uh, on the continent of Africa, especially uh, those scenes we saw in Nigeria? Well, I'm, I'm certainly part of the African diaspora with, with roots uh, on the continent, and it is concerning. I think what we are seeing is partly um, the continuing um, confrontation between Shia and Sunni. Uh, for influence, and, and um, we can see that Iran is trying to spread influence, but um, they might also say that the Shia, uh, including you know the uh, Salafists, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Shia would, would say that the Sunni, including the, the Salafists and the Wahhabists, have had the continent to themselves. And, and that they're, they're only trying to, to, to have part of the action, if you like, as it were. Um, so you, you need perhaps to see you know, some of these in, in that context. And also the fact that northern Nigeria has been uh, pretty much um, a Sunni block um, from the, the original jihads of Uthman Danfodium until this emergence. And so there, there's also that kind of local power play as well. Um, it's also important that in confronting some of these issues, governments uh, deal with an even hand. I mean, there are reportedly over 700 people still missing from the incident that was on, the, on that last um, clip, and um, very little response from the government as to a judicial process um, to resolve that, which doesn't help because it only tends to inflame the matter further and allow for young um, Shias to possibly be further radicalized because those reports can then be used as, as a means of inflaming their emotions. So there are, there are a lot of factors at play there and um, we, we need to see them in that broader perspective as well. Absolutely. But also, isn't it alarming to see the extent of uh, Iran's terror networks uh, going deep into many African nations um, that can only result in really conflict and, and, and bad news? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, these uh, uh, terror networks need to be uprooted. They need to be confronted. 
um, I think the point that I'm making is that the methodology of doing so uh, needs to avoid um, scoring own goals, as it were, and, and handing um, propaganda to the, uh, to the very people that you're trying to confront. Um, I don't, however, see the possibility of Iran um, you know, covering the African continent as, as that map um, showed. I, I think that um, the awareness uh, of uh, some of these networks has grown to a point now where it will be extremely difficult for them to do so. Absolutely. And, and talking now about uh, the connection between Israel uh, and Africa, and, and you spoke a little bit about it uh, earlier in the interview, um, Adoya. Uh, can we discuss really how Israel is blessing Africa in terms of uh, irrigation technology uh, and how that um, the current Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has, has really seen that the continent of Africa um, is so important to Israel that he, uh, he, he's done many trips to Africa to strengthen alliances between many African states and the one and only Jewish state. Yes, that does bring a number of things together there, Simon, because we talked about the ancient connections and we talked about uh, some of the um, conditions in which the problems of terrorism and, and insecurity on the African continent grow. And very often, these are always worse in underdevelopment. Now, Israel is uh, a country that is a, a modern miracle, if you like. Uh, people who return to a land that was almost a desert uh, and have made it bloom. And so Israel is particularly well placed uh, in the um, techniques and the technologies that she developed to be able to restore Israel to the uh, beautiful country that it is today to come and help places in Africa. Some of these places that we've been talking about um, are the very places that need to bloom again. And so um, the uh, technology from Israel has indeed been a great blessing to many parts of Africa as they seek to develop the continent. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at the wonderful work that Israel is doing in Africa. Innovation Africa was funded nine years ago with a very simple mission, which is to bring Israeli solar technologies to transform schools, medical centers, and most importantly, to pump water. We are operating in seven African countries, and we have so far installed solar technology in over 100 villages. The reason why Africa is still in poverty is because of the lack of energy. Because there is no energy, people are still searching for water because there is no energy to pump water. People do not have access to vaccines and medicines because there is no electricity in medical centers. And because there is no energy, people cannot get good education. And yet, when you look at the sun, there is so much energy, so much potential. And if we could just harness the energy from the sun, we can change it. We've been using solar energy since the creation of Israel. Almost on every building, there are solar panels. And what we are doing at Innovation Africa, it's simply by bringing the same technologies, simple technologies, to make a change here in the villages.
Thank you for having come from Israel to take us away from the nakedness. Thank you very much for the clean water. You are our fathers and mothers from Israel. Because today Israel is a strong country, because of everything that has been invented, I feel it's our responsibility to help. Are you ready? One, two, three, go! That's the nation I love, the nation of Israel, uh, helping other nations like African nations, providing them water, providing them with power and electricity. Uh, absolutely incredible and inspirational. Um, Adoye, that was just inspirational, just seeing what Israel's doing. And, and that is the Israel that I know. And, and uh, sadly, that is the Israel that the world should know because Israel's humanitarian efforts and passion uh, and uh, love for other nations and wanting to make the world a better place goes deep into the Jewish psyche, doesn't it? Absolutely. And as you say, this is a story that is often not told and gets lost behind the other headlines. And no, no nation is perfect and neither is Israel. But this kind of story of such wonderful work that's being done in many nations really needs to be better told. And it's not only in times like this, but whenever there are natural disasters, it's often the Israeli teams that are the first to arrive with medical care uh, and, and with first responders who can help even in the most tragic of situations. So there's so much wonderful work that is being done and it really needs to be told more. Absolutely. Uh, and also you've been um instrumental really in uh, developing uh, close ties between the emerging uh, Christian church and the nation of Israel. Um, it's really, I think, very much been, been your call to, calling, uh, Adoye. But can you explain to us that here and the value of uh, African Christians in their stand with Israel and, and how that they will soon be a force to be reckoned with? Well, I believe they already are very much a force to be reckoned with uh, globally. Again, we need to put this in a context that the uh, center of gravity of Christianity has shifted, if you like, from the north to the south, uh, so that the, the numbers and therefore the finances and the political clout of the church is now southwards. Uh, yes, you have the uh, historic centers of, uh, of European Christianity still in the northern hemisphere, uh, but you go into Africa, you find gatherings of Christians, sometimes a single preacher. You know, there'll be millions of people turn up, you know. Um, and, and when I went to, out to Israel, it must have been a decade or more ago, um, I spoke to people that I met there. I said, do you realize this emerging potential that there are so many Christians who uh, you need to engage with? And so we began to uh, try and find ways to do that. Uh, one of the things that we worked with is the ambulance service, uh, Magrin de Vidodon, and uh, we were able to get a number of uh, African churches involved with this, and uh, people like uh, the uh, leader of the uh, Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor E.R.W., has come to Israel a number of times to, with his congregations and given ambulances um, to the people of Israel. Um, and there began then, um, one of the things about engaging with Israel as a Christian is that it brings your faith to life. It brings the Bible to life. It, it makes you suddenly have a different perspective on all that you've been reading for all of the years. And so it's been amazing really watching this unfolding relationship between not just um, Christians from Africa, but from America. I've, I've seen um, 
very senior uh, African-American church leaders now beginning to engage with Israel, uh, visiting Israel, and, and so it's just been a joy to, to be a part of that. Uh, uh, and finally, can you tell us about you, your book that you've written here, Africa, Christianity, and the Bible, Our Global Destiny? Well, I thought that you know, this is a story, again, that for many people, when you talk about Christianity and Africa, it's all about um, some missionaries who came from Europe maybe in the 18th and 19th centuries. But Africa's history of Christianity goes back to the very early days of the day of Pentecost. If you look at the list of people who were there, there were several who came from Africa. It was the Ethiopian eunuch and, and so on. So uh, we wanted to just tell this story and make um, not just Africans, but everyone realize that the story of Africa, Christianity, and the Bible is a long and interesting, fascinating story. If you get a copy of the book, there is so much there for you to enjoy. Excellent. Uh, and finally, uh, Adoye, can you uh, maybe inspire or give a message to uh, some of our African viewers who watch this program about why they should stand with Israel and the Jewish people? Oh, absolutely. The relationship between Africans and the Jews goes back millennia. It goes back to the very early pages of the Bible, and it continues all through into the New Testament. Jesus himself spent time in Africa. And today, the Africans are the people who can make a big difference, and we should stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Archbishop uh, Dewey Agoma, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's uh, Middle East Report. I thank you thank that you've you. been an inspiration and you've really brought alive a subject that uh, not many of us know about, and that's the deep spiritual and political connection between the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and the continent of Africa and its people. Thank you again for inviting me, sir. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. And uh, I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. We've gone through the deep spiritual and political connections between the nation of Israel and the people of Africa and its continent. And it's important that we see the emergence of the African church stand with Israel and the Jewish people to not only pray for Israel, but also to give Israel a political voice and uh, this is something that we need to see and we need to pray into being. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. I'm 